All right, hello. My name is uh, Sean Braithwaite, and I work at Informal Systems on the engineering side. Uh, we do formal verification of distributed systems. Most of the stuff we do is in the Cosmos ecosystem right now, uh, but we're looking to do collaborations for the greater cryptocurrency scene. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the last thing that we did, which was write a light client for Tendermint. And we wrote a light client in Rust, and we built it for formal verification. So this is the first um, software artifact that releases as, as a product of our process. So we're, we're, we're pretty excited. We have the Tenement RS repo that's available on our, on our GitHub, um, which, is gonna be, which is eventually going to be a full node of, uh, of the entire uh, Tenement protocol. But right now, what we're releasing is just the light client. So you can go and, uh, and play with that and compare it to the uh, Go implementation if you want. Uh, which might lead to the question of like, why would we write another one? And why would we write it in Rust? Well, uh, the first implementation of Tendermint, which was very essential to launching the network, was not built for formal verification. And we wanted to try and build one that was. So before we talk about uh, what we built, I think we need to talk about what the greater objectives of the ecosystem are. So Cosmos is, was planned to be the internet of, of blockchains to provide sovereignty and, and inter interop between uh, finite state machines. And uh, maybe a picture is the best way to look at it. So you can imagine that there are not one, but many blockchains, because that's actually what the world is and that's actually what's in the picture. Um, so for instance, you have Ethereum on the far right, and then Bitcoin on the left. And then you have the Cosmos Hub, which was the network that was launched, which is built on Tendermint PBFT. And then you have Agoric, which is a, a, another hub. Right. So beyond the uh, nodes, what is important is what connects them. So the, the, the vision of, of, of Cosmos that was imagined was to have a permissionless interop protocol called IBC. So IBC allows um, one chain to connect to another without an intermediary. So essentially you can do atomic swaps between, uh, between chains. Maybe the easiest way to look at it is from the inside. So imagine you have, instead of having uh, you know, a multitude of chains, let's just focus on two for simplicity's sake. So on the left you have chain A, and on the right you have chain B, right? You can imagine that uh, each blockchain is represented by a finite state machine, which is somehow replicated across nodes to, to serve as like internal logic. And what is important here is that these chains can be extended to implement uh, the inner blockchain protocol, right? To essentially process a special type of transaction that is uh, particular to uh, facilitating interop with other blockchains, or it's a set of, of, of transactions that is essential to uh, interrupting with different blockchains. So one question is like, if a transaction on chain A is meant, is destined for being somehow replicated and integrated on chain B, how does it get there? Well, this in the middle of the diagram with um, indexed unit five, the, the, the relayer is responsible for effectively listening to uh, changes on chain A and then relaying to chain B. But you could also envision how you wouldn't want to uh, relay invalid packets, right? So essentially you need a way to verify a packet or a, a transaction before you, um, before you relay it. So to do this, we have the uh, light client verification protocol. And the light client verification protocol allows us to um, essentially verify state uh, without a sort of accumulating it. So without having um, the entire blockchain history. So in short, the light client verifies state using only headers. So the, the metadata, something that describes, um, uh, that, that describes uh, the, the particular parts of the state chain without the transactions themselves. You can imagine that this is uh, uh, somewhat essential, right, to uh, a number of applications, the relay only being one of them. Another uh, application would probably be in, in running on low power devices. So if you ever wanted to essentially verify state as an embedded uh, component to a larger application deployed on a mobile device, right, you would probably need to embed a like client. So I think there are a, a lot of uh, other use cases that we can sort of um, envision, but it's kind of essential to the adoption of the 
ecosystem that we get this bit right. So let's look at how it works. So I think to understand um, the inner workings of the of the light client, you need to consider like the Tendermint consensus safety guarantees, right? So Tendermint is a um, um, is a proof of stake network, which means that there are a subset of the nodes in the network that are actually uh, proposing and, 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 and validating blocks. And uh, these nodes uh, essentially have to put something uh, at stake before they can participate in, at that level, right? So they need to actually um, lock up some, some, some funds denominated in, in, in some unit, right? That says that if they were to commit malfeasance, like either by you know, double signing or any other number of of malicious activities, right? They could be they could be punished, so they should be they 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 could be slashed. And you can imagine that the 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 set of validators, the set of nodes that is responsible for 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 or responsible in general, but in particular at the at the risk of of getting slashed, right? It's uh, changing, right? So it's not always the same people who are voting. There could be new validators coming in and other ones rotating out. So if you consider, how do you trust? a changing set of participants. Uh, the, 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 way, the easiest way to think about it is that if you um, participate rightfully with a majority of other people, right, then you could also be trusted. So you could imagine initiating from Genesis that you would, you would form some set of validators that would be produced through social consensus, right? And then uh, essentially you would follow the change of the validator set um, by, by maintaining the majority of, uh, of the trusted, and then you could sort of move forward. So in the diagram, what you have is like three headers that are sort of increasing in time. So H1 would have some validator set, H2 would potentially have another validator set, and H3 would, would potentially have a completely different validator set. And you can imagine that from social consensus to H1, um, you could sort of rightfully trust them because it's in the bonding period. The validator set has not changed significantly enough uh, that you would, you would be skeptical of the, of the people that are in there. Now, as, as H2 happens, it's possible that the people from Genesis, right, um, have, have decided to stop validating, right, but are still in the, in the unbonding period. And in the unbonding period, you could still be slashed. So you're, you've committed to, uh, to stop validating, but you haven't stopped validating just yet, okay? And then H3, which is sort of uh, at the end of the unbonding bonding period, right, you're in this phase where your, your funds are free and you can no longer be slashed and therefore you should not be trusted. So what the light client protocol is doing is trying to figure out what, what it can trust based on the uh, changes of the, um, of the validator set. But it's clear that this is not just, uh, that this question uh, about trust is somehow bound to uh, how people can be punished. So one of the things a lot of people look at, at light clients as, as, as sort of um, takers and not givers insofar as they don't uh, contribute directly uh, to, to producing blocks, right? But one thing that our light client does because of like the finality assumptions of our consensus protocol, that is assumed that like when, when, it, when a block is, is final, any, any change of value is already differing value at that, at that height constitutes a, um, a fork. So we have this uh, protocol essentially to detect forks that is um, conducted by our light client. So AWAS, the light client is consuming headers, trying to get to the most recent state. It's also uh, comparing those headers uh, between peers. So it won't just ask for a header from uh, a single peer, it'll ask from multiple. And then it'll actually perform the, if, if, if those headers are, are different, right? So maybe there's a different uh, application state then it will actually perform verification to see where in the lineage of that chain did, did things differ. Now, the, the, the light client can't uh, actually punish those, um, those, those the, the nodes. If they were to commit some kind of uh, malfeasance, the light client could not punish them, but they can report them. So what the, the light client is responsible for doing is doing fork detection and also submitting evidence to the um, to, to a full node. So it doesn't submit to one, it submits to many. So the, the light client is therefore responsible for maintaining sort of a, a set of peers that it could one query um, headers from uh, to update state, maybe in parallel, and two, uh, uh, performing fork detection, so seeing the difference, and then three, 
um, submitting any evidence of differing values at a similar height, right, uh, to, to the full node for a completely separate protocol, right, uh, called uh, fork accountability. So you'd imagine that once the evidence is submitting, you're gonna have some process of like, you know, figuring out who is, who is lying. And that can only be performed by uh, the full node, but that's kind of like out, outside of, uh, of the scope of, uh, of this talk. But it, it's still uh, pretty important that, uh, that we get this, this, this protocol right. Not just the protocol, but the, but the implementation. You can understand how in the context of, of, of IBC, right, relaying packets between chains might be very hard to diagnose because the, the receiving end will be a completely different, different blockchain, right? And also in the case of, um, of, of mobile phones, you can imagine how, how, how useless a system would be if it, if it would to trust the unjust state, you know, especially in a, in a permissionless network. So the question is, you know, what would be the value of, 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 of an unjust system? Like why would, if people did not trust it, right? If it, if it didn't work, why would anyone uh, bother participating in it? So in a lot of ways with these public blockchains, it's, it, it's pretty essential that we bake correctness in from, from the onset. onset. And um, as a previous message, this is kind of um, really the, the, the motivation for informal as a company <laughs> and uh, the light client rewrite and, and Rust in, in particular. So what we wanted to do is, um, is, is not just design a spec, but a, um, but a software artifact, which kept pretty closely uh, aligned with that spec o over time. So we kind of took a completely different approach of, of you know, making sure that our protocol was safe, it was, it, it was lively, and that these properties, these invariants would, would stay over, over time. And that required sort of like a, like a multi-prone approach. So the first thing that we did is uh, specify this sort of in this English, this, this formalized English, like something that could be kind of extracted into a, uh, uh, an academic paper pretty, pretty easily. So easily, in fact, that we just submitted a bunch of papers with anticipation of, of, of publishing at least to, to archive in the, um, in, in the coming weeks. But what, what's most important uh, in this is not the particulars. I don't, I don't know if it's, it's feasible or even useful to kind of read the particular slide right now, except for uh, these sort of indexed invariants, right? So all the things that we expect to be true, these like temporal properties, so things that are like um, always true, uh, something, uh, things that are uh, sometimes true, some things that are never true, and things that are like eventually true. You know, these temporal properties are like enumerated and indexed, right? And so the idea there is that we expect from the onset that these temporal properties will be like, one, the subject of conversation. We're going to negotiate and figure them out and probably iterate them over time. So it helps to have a reference, but are also expected to be represented in multiple forms, uh, readable by computers. So one of the ways that we represent these temporal properties is of course in TLA plus. So this allows us to um, essentially perform verification um, for those not familiar with, with, with TLA plus, essentially you, you, you specify uh, a bunch of temporal properties, and then it essentially generates an exhaustive set of examples trying to figure out where those properties are violated. So it will give you the, the output of this process, you know, if, depending on how you see it, successful or unsuccessful, would be a, a counterexample of, of a, a case in which the things that you say uh, is, is definitely not true. So this is um, uh, critical to, uh, at, at the protocol level, like ensuring that uh, what, we, what we think is true is actually true in a computable way um, and has been kind of essential to us um, uh, finding a lot of bugs. And so one of the things we did with, with the light client is essentially write the spec in English in TLA uh, pretty much at the same time. Um, so a lot of the abstractions that we, we came up in the in sort of design uh, phase, right? were ported over or back and forth between different representations of, uh, of, of the protocol. And I guess like of all the representations, you know, uh, of correctness, the, probably the biggest one is the, is the actual code itself. So I guess this is another, maybe not the most ideal screenshot because not all of it is important, but there are certain parts that are important. Uh, one important part is the last line on 147 that shows a little bit of rust. So yes, there is actual, uh, a Rust implementation of this. That's what we're releasing. 
and that's what you could uh, run on the network. Uh, but what the, the point that I want to make is that the, the indexes, the, the, the tags, right, uh, that are mentioned in the English spec and then represented in TLA are also present in the code. And the, the format of the English spec that specifies like post and preconditions for individual functions are included as sort of predicates that are annotating the functions that they're, um, that they're specifying. So that means that if we run this in test code, we're gonna get, or in test mode, we're gonna get uh, the same errors, uh, right, that we would get um, in the spec in the actual uh, executing artifact. So this is this is this is pretty uh, this this is pretty cool and is kind of uh, essential if if we want to take this this um, this idea of of a form of verification seriously because you know correctness does not uh, stop you know software is 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 an evolutionary process it's an iterative process uh, and it's going to change and the question is like what is the value of having a specification for an outdated or an outdated spec. It's kind of like um, uh, the value of like outdated documentation. You know, at one point that 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 product, right? That either the documentation or that spec was a was an asset, right? But as the software process continues, it becomes a liability because you have to keep it up to date. So one of the things that we're working on are tools to help maintain alignment um, between um, between English. Uh, TLA and, and, and software artifacts. But all of this uh, can be contributed today. And this is where, you know, we could use your help. So one of the ways that you could uh, contribute to the process of developing light client and Cosmos in general, right, is to come work with us. That's one idea. Another idea is to run uh, the light client, right, uh, on the Cosmos hub or, or other tenement ba based chains, right? And actually performing fork detection. That, is, that means that you don't have to run a full node. You don't have to have like gigabytes of, 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 of disk or terabytes, let's be honest, of, of disk space. And you could uh, you'll probably start contributing uh, the same day. So that'd be uh, fantastic. Uh, another way is, is with the code. So participating in this uh, endeavor to, uh, to formally specify distributed systems. If this is something that is, that is interesting, uh, interesting to you, uh, we would we would we would love your contribution or uh, your perspective. So thank you for that.